Be turning to Ephesians chapter 4. Last week we finished at least what we intended to do in that book, but this will draw from more of it. When I say last week, I mean in the adult class. Ephesians chapter 4. Culturally, socially, politically, and religiously, pluralism is the order of the day. Now that can be bad, and it can be good, and we have to define our terms and then make the application where it belongs to know whether it would be bad or it would be good. Someone wrote a book, a fellow by the name of Jake Barnett, or maybe it was an article back in 2016, in the Times of Israel, entitled, Respect the Otherness of the Other. Somebody says that's about as good a definition of pluralism as you can get. Respect the otherness of the others. Well, I have no problem with that because even where people disagree strongly on various things doesn't mean you can't show respect for them. And when we've been in debates, four-night debate, then we try to show respect for our opponents in those discussions. And we often point out that there's nothing personally involved in these things. I'm not saying there hasn't been at times people violated that and it got very personal with them, but that's not what it ought to be. So we pointed out that uh, we may not even hardly know one another personally, but the difference is over doctrine, over what we teach as to whether it's right or it's wrong. So if you're talking about simply respect for the other person, Jesus had a lot to say about that. And he was basically saying that when he says, love your enemies. You have to understand the nature of the love of an enemy that he talks about, but nevertheless, that would involve respect. But then I come along in the, what, about 1992 or somewhere back in there. Some will remember this. And that is pluralism being defined by Rodney King's question, why can't we all just get along? Well, that sheds a new light on the definition. Why can't we all just get along? So as to whether pluralism is a good thing or a bad thing, I have to know what the person means by it. To show you... Uh, how it's been discussed, though they didn't use the term many times, they would use the definition of pluralism. Usually it means more than one, <laughs> plural. But if you go back to uh, James Madison in Federalist Paper Number 10, he discusses that as far as forming a nation. By pluralism, he meant there, as far as uh, government is concerned, uh, toleration for tailors and for farmers and for businessmen and for sailors. Are they all going to be represented? Why can the government allow each one of those to be represented? And uh, we know that is the Federalist today, but it really, are, are the Federalist Papers, but it really was in the paper called the Federalist. That's where they all appeared because this was in about 1787, thereabouts. And he and James uh, Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and others were all involved in overthrowing the new nation. I don't know if we realize that or not. They were under the Articles of Confederation. And to even have a constitutional convention was to rebel against the new nation and form a different and better government. And thus they had to have a constitution. I don't know whether many people even think about that, but pluralism there is not a bad thing uh, when it comes to each person according to his background and profession and vocation, having uh, something that will allow him to be respected and have a voice in government. And you'll find, if you go all the way back to Aristotle, 
that he discussed those things from the standpoint of the democracies that the Greeks knew, and it gets very involved. And so pluralism is not just a term you can throw out there and say it's a bad thing, although I'll say again, culturally, socially, politically, and religiously, pluralism is the big to-do today. And yet we might find that um, it's been a big to-do for a long time. So I'm not necessarily interested in this sermon with pluralism as applied to society or politics and or culture. Now listen, except, 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 as it involves religious and moral conduct. Now that takes on a complete different color. <laughs> because what pluralism is, and that is, is what Rodney King said. Let's just all agree to disagree to get along. You're not wrong, I'm not wrong, you're not right, I'm not right. Everybody just as right as they can be, regardless of how different their beliefs are. Now you see then that pluralism to one extent or the other has been around in the religious world for a long, long time. And if you look at the whole of all the religions in the world, you'll see that whether it's Islam or the Hindus or the Buddhists, uh, whatever, that they're trying to say, well, let's all just get along. Let's not point a finger as if this is wrong and you're right, etc. Many religious people desire for all religions to simply coexist without much, and here's the key, of any concern for truth. And that seems to be permeating great many people regardless of their view of pluralism or anything else. It's a way of getting what they want regardless of the truth, even to the point where they will change the definition of truth. And that's what the postmodernist has done. He's come along and said, your truth, my truth. I want you to notice this because I've noticed it for several years now. You'll see Oprah, Oprah Winfrey every once in a while on television because she does these interviews nowadays. And I promise you, if you will listen, even to advertise an upcoming interview that she's going to do, you will hear her say something like this regarding the people she's going to interview. I just wanted them to be able to have a chance to tell their truth. Now, people don't realize those are up red flags because they don't pay enough attention to what people believe. They go on likes and dislikes and feelings and emotions, and if you held your mouth one way one day, you really like them, but if you held it again another day, you don't. But truth is what Christianity is built on. All of the religions of God, when I say religion, patriarchal, mosaical, Christian, all those three religions, as he unfolded the scheme of redemption, as you read about it in your Bible, every one of them pertained to the truth revealed by God that he expected man, as he made man to know it, to learn and to abide by it. But pluralism in religious matters has to do with everybody just being at peace with one another and nobody trying to show everything uh, to be one way or another. But I remind you, and I say it again for emphasis, Jesus began his religion with truth as the basis for unity and fellowship among his followers. If you continue in my word, he said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. Indeed, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Then Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 said to all of us, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And you look at 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. I'm interested in truth as the final basis for determining right and wrong in all things in life. But pluralism has long been the rule among most religions. 
and especially those that we are rubbing shoulders with all the time, and that is the denominational churches. You go to your church, and I'll go to mine, we'll all get to heaven together. The Bible nowhere teaches, but that doesn't bother them. They go right ahead and seemingly, if we can just say it enough and enough of us believe it, it'll make it true. Oh, but that's a sad view of how you learn, know what truth is. Denominationalism cannot exist without pluralism. That is, among the denominations who make up denominationalism. And they admit they are parts of the whole. Each denominational church admits it's not the whole, but a part of the whole. Never do you find the church in the New Testament of Jesus Christ presented in that way. Thus, you can begin to see as fundamental and first principles those things are, people don't pay much attention to them. Because we live in an age to where I've got my mindset, I don't care where it is, in what area of society, this is where it's going to be. And don't confuse me with the facts. Because I don't even know that there is a fact. <laughs> There's no getting around the biblical fact that the oneness of the church of which you read about in your own New Testament is clearly taught in that New Testament. So, to appreciate oneness, I want us to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Remember, here is a church in the city of Ephesus in Asia, and a letter is written to that church by an inspired apostle. And he knows this is going to make up a part of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And we begin reading. And I'll just drop with verse 1 to get it in its context rather than start with verse 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, our verses of which we were interested. There is, well, is there? <laughs> there is one body and one Spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now I want you to notice that that's not what denominationalism teaches, nor does pluralism teach. Pluralism says you've got all these different bodies and we just all get along with one another. Nobody tries to say, well, what you're teaching is not the truth. And somebody else says, well, yes, it is. And somebody else says, well, what they're teaching is not the truth. Because truth, who in the world knows what they think truth is? Oh, they'll give lip service, denominationalism is, to the Bible as the Word of God. But the implications in their actions show they don't really believe it. Oh, they'd rise up and fight over what I just said. And think about that for a minute. But if you're going to call him Lord, then do what he tells you. Our Lord said that. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If you love him with all that you are and have, Jesus said to his very apostles, the one closest to him in his earthly ministry, John 14, 15, if you love me, American Standard says, you will keep my commandments. So there is foundational, first principle, basic truth. And it is the truth revealed in the Bible concerning how one's saved from sin. And here is God's platform for oneness or unity. And that's very important to understand. Notice he says there's one body. Well... Whatever that one body is, there's just one. Somebody said one time, well, if you got one and plus one and you got two. And the fellow responds and says, well, I, 
I think they recognize the number one and the plus and the one, but I don't know that they know it equals two. So sometimes, no matter how we reason with the facts that are presented to us, if we recognize their facts and in the context in which they're found, we don't know how to reason or else we don't. So whatever the body is, <laughs> there's just one of them. And if I know what one is, it's not two. And it's not three. It's one. Now, what is that one? There is one body. That's as plain as it can get. There is one body. I asked the question, is there? The inspired Holy Spirit through Paul says there is. Now, can we start there? There is one body. Well, if you look in this same book earlier, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul says to these same people, in fact, he's laid this down before he ever said what we just noted, there is one body, and they would have that background besides our earlier teaching elsewhere in the gospel of what he's talking about when he talks about the church. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Watch it which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Well, I know what that one body is. It's the church. But he says over here in Ephesians 4, there's one body. Can we think a little bit? The body is the church and there's one body. Now, how many churches did the Lord build? Well, he promised to build only one, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And in Acts chapter 2, Luke records by inspiration that he did. And the Lord added the saved to the church on that first Pentecost for the resurrection of Christ. There was but one. They didn't, they didn't get up there and say, now which church shall I join? That is coming from the fermented imagination of men's minds. And the idea of denominationalism, as it's very familiar to us, didn't arise to 1,500 years after what you read about in Acts 2. It's unknown to the New Testament. You've got the same thing said over here in Colossians. They had no problem with it. They wouldn't know what you were talking about if you talked about, uh, Paul, what denominational churches are in Troas? He, he wouldn't have known anything about that because it didn't exist. In Colossians 1 and verse 18 says the same thing again. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now look at verse 24. Who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Why, Paul? Why are you continuing to suffer since Christ left off suffering? You continue to suffer as one of his apostles for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, what's difficult to understand about that? Do you believe this is the Word of God? Do you believe this is telling you about the church that Jesus built and purchased with his own blood? Acts 20 and verse 28. Thus, there's one church. The church is his body, and there's one body, and the body is the church. The world boasts greatly of many bodies. And it talks about regularly, join the church of your choice. That's the order of the day and has been for many, many years. But if you look at 2 and verse 16, Paul says concerning Christ, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities of powers, all things were created by him and for him. Christ is the head. Christ said he had all authority, didn't he? He built the church, didn't he? Well, now look in verse 16 of the next chapter. Acts 2, verse 16. That no man therefore judge you Colossians 2.16, that no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days. Now, why? Because they're under a different authority. If you were a Jew under the law when it was binding, you would judge yourself as to whether you're faithful in some of these areas. Not true anymore now that you're under the law to Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1 verse 25. If you look at Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, Paul will talk about the church. 
I'm trying to simply point out how simple this is. Why do we misunderstand it? In Ephesians 5 and verse uh, 23, he wants peace to be, or rather in 6, 23, he has, talks about peace being extended as he closes the letter. But then he's in a discussion in Acts 5 of husbands and wives. They understood all of that. But then he makes an application in verse 23. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. Christ is the head of the church, he's the savior of the body. Well, we might expect him to do so. He built that church, he added the same to that church. He's the head of that church. There's one of them. It's his church. What's well, difficult to understand about that? Well, that's the first thing in God's platform for unity. One body. But then you'll notice he says one spirit. We mentioned this morning in class and beginning to talk about a little bit about the book of Philippians, striving together in one spirit. Well, he says there's one spirit. There's one spirit. When you look at the Godhead, there's the Father, the first person of the Godhead. There's the executor of the Father's will, the eternal word who became flesh, Christ. And then there's the third person, the Holy Spirit. And there's only one of them. In John 16, 13, where Christ is talking about the Holy Spirit coming to work with the apostles after he goes back to heaven, he will refer to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. Now, why would he do that? Because the primary work of the third person of the Godhead is the revealer and confirmer of the truth of Jesus Christ. That was his major work, his primary work. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. The Holy Spirit convicted me of sin, converted me to Christ, and keeps me faithful through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is also the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. So it's called the New Testament of the Bible. Through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit does His work. Look in Ephesians uh, 3. Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6. Paul, writing to these people, wanted them to know about Christianity, and he knew he was an instrumental part of informing them and teaching them. And he says, how that by revelation he made known to me. Paul, where did you get your information about Christ? Why, well, he revealed it to me. The mystery, that which had been unrevealed. He says, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it now is revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That's why Christ said he would do, didn't he? Read chapters 14, 15, 16 of John and see that. Then in verse 6, notice how all that's involved in the spreading of the gospel, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Same body. Jew and Gentile. Reconcile to God in one body. How? By belief and obedience to the same gospel. And that one body is the church. There's God's unity among all men. So there's a body of revealed truth. It is the New Testament of Christ. Totality is the whole of the Bible, specifically for Christianity. It is the authority of Christ in the New Testament. Now, if we believe, teach, and practice things inconsistent with or contrary to what the one Spirit has revealed, then we believe, teach, and practice error and not the truth. That's what people don't want to understand. But then he says there's one hope in God's great platform for unity. And you can call each one of these planks in his platform for unity. In Christ we have hope eternal. 
I don't know how many times that's said in different ways throughout the whole of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Ephesians 2, 12, Colossians 1, 27, and on and on. Hope is the expectation a faithful child of God, a member of the church, of the one body, has in going to heaven. And he's so anxious to get there, he earnestly desires to receive it. Hope can't be defined by just expectation. It's an earnest desire to want to go to heaven. And I've seen some Christians that talk about, well, we want to go to heaven, but let's hold on earth as long as we can. Let's hang on scratching our <laughs> fingernails and hold on as long as we can. But I want to go to heaven. Well, I die. well it's like an old country song said it. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. 1 Peter 1, 3, we are begotten unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to ask something. Is your hope lively? Or is it taking a nap? It is through the gospel that we are begotten in Christ. So Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15. Or said in another way, are partakers, made partakers of his promise in Christ, Ephesians 3, 6. If one is begotten through, there's the avenue. If one is begotten through something else, then he is begotten unto something else in order to get there. Any hope other than the one hope the gospel gives is no hope at all. And thus, outside of Christ or unfaithful to Christ, you have no hope whatsoever. Then he says there's one Lord. One Lord. I've always liked to say there is many churches acceptable to God. As there are lords acceptable to God. And he says there's one Lord. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6, here's the way it's put. Though there be many lords, plural, lords many, there is but one Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who possesses all power in heaven or authority in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28, 18. Now that destroys all these councils and synods and conferences making rules and regulations. Destroys all creeds and catechisms. The Bible, the Bible only makes Christians only the only Christians. That's all it ever has done in the Christian age. All religious teaching and practice is to be done in His name or by His authority. That's what it means to do something in His name is to do it as He's authorized. Colossians 3.17 again. So this means there is... One single solitary standard of authority. And to teach or practice that which is not authorized by the Christ is to teach and preach that which is without divine authority. Our own brethren don't even understand that. They won't realize that when you say, I believe this in religion, they ought to be able to say, book, chapter, and verse teaches it. Now, a lot of times people use belief in this modern usage. I think this, or you think all sorts of things. But when you say, I believe, as it's used, the verb form of faith in the New Testament, then you're meaning you can show it's taught in the Bible. Or don't say you believe it. Unless you want to say, I believe it, and it's contrary to the Bible, and I'm perfectly happy with that. But we don't believe that. Notice I said, we don't believe that. Then there's one faith. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul was said to have preached the faith. That's used the same way it is in Jude 3. Contend for the faith. It would be the same thing as contend for the gospel. Contend for the faith. Contend for the word. Contend for the New Testament. It's where a part stands for the whole or a whole stands for the part. In this case, a part stands for the whole. So when it said that Paul preached the faith, he preached the gospel, the totality of the information in the New Testament needed to convert and keep a person saved. So what did he preach when he preached the faith? Well, again, plainly it says in the second chapter of Galatians that he preached the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 tells you what the gospel is. Thus the faith is the gospel, and there's but one gospel, thus there is what? One faith. Any gospel other than the one true gospel is perversion. Paul dealt with that in the first chapter of Galatians. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. Let him be accursed. 
There in the Greek, it means a gospel of a different kind from what I preached. So they're all out there, all sorts of kinds, contrary to what Paul teaches. Well, how do I know what Paul teaches? He said you read what he wrote, you'd know. <laughs> Can you get plainer than that? If you read what I wrote, Paul says, you'll understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, you either have to come down then saying, I just don't understand what he said or else I don't believe it. We cannot be saved without that gospel. I've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Paul says you are. We're called by that gospel, so he said to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, and to the Colossians in Colossians 3 and verse 15. And we're commanded, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're begotten by that gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 15 and 1 Peter 1, 3. And there's one of them. That's all. One faith, one gospel. Not many. But then we move on to this other plank, the fifth plank in God's platform for unity. One baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 reads, in Paul writing, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. What is that body? What is that body? Does he tell us? Yeah, he says the body is the church. Colossians 1, 18, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And you're baptized into one church. You don't become saved and then say, well, which church I want to be a part of? I really like this one over here. Tried this one out, didn't like it much. I'll go over here. You can't find that out in your Bible. Read your New Testament. I'm not telling you something that's not there. Read your New Testament. The problem is people don't read today. People don't read the New Testament. They don't read the Bible, period. They read everything else. You ever notice how much time we spend watching or reading things that really don't have any long-lasting impact or importance? However many spirits and bodies there are, that's how many baptisms there are. The one baptism is based on gospel teaching, Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15. Faith, repentance, confession of faith. And that qualifies one then to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. That's what happened in Acts 8, 36 through 39, and Romans 6, 3 and 4. He reminds the Romans of what they did in becoming Christians. They were baptized into Christ's death. They were raised to walk in newness of life. Their sins were remitted. That's why they rose in newness of life. It is an immersion in water. It's not sprinkling water on anybody. It's not pouring water on anybody. It is the body being buried in water, Acts 8, 36 through 39. Romans 6, 3 and 4 again. And what's the purpose of it? Four, or in two, the remission or forgiveness of your past and alien sins. The sins that separate you from God in the first place. Acts 2.38. And according to Galatians 3.26, when you do that from the heart, Romans 6.17 and 18, you're baptized I-N-T-O into Christ, the one body, His church, to which He adds you is another way of saying it, Acts 2.47. But then notice we move from one baptism. There is one God. This is our sixth plank, God's platform for unity. Though there be many gods, 1 Corinthians 8, 5, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things. There has always been and there always will be only one true God. You'll see this emphasized to a great extent is to go back to the prophets and read when they were battling idolatry among the Israelites and read that. 1 Kings 18, Isaiah 40 through 48, all those chapters. And any other God... According to Isaiah, is a God that cannot save. Isaiah 45, 20. Now, where are we on all of this? Do you know what one means? That's who we are. And do you know what seven planks there are in that one? Our plea is no body but the one body, no spirit but the one spirit, no hope but the one hope. No Lord but the one Lord. No faith but the one faith. No baptism but the one baptism. And no God but the one God. Now let me ask you something. If you're claiming God is your Father, the Bible is the Word of God, and Christ is your Savior, find something wrong with that. And you can't. Unless you want to just deny there's a God or deny Christ is the Son of God or deny the Bible is the Word of God. Do all sorts of things if you do that. 
The plea of the seven ones of Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, is the plea for unity, and it's the only unity that will work. It is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, the unity the Spirit reveals in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4, 3. Now here's what will happen, and we'll close here. This will cause believers in Christ to have the unity of worship, one God. Unity in authority, one Lord. Unity in message, one faith. Unity in practice, one baptism. Unity in organization, one body. And unity in life, desire and expectation, one spirit and one hope. That's the only basis there is for unity that God wants. Cannot be found in the United Nations. Not be found in any nation in this world. It's only in the eternal kingdom. And if you're a member of the church, you're a citizen of the eternal kingdom. And Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Not look and see just what all these things covers. Matthew 6, 33. Our chief interest, our fundamental interest, our basic interest is God's platform for unity and all that it implies and what we're to do. In the kingdom that will remain when all of the kingdoms and nations and governments have ceased. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. Our Lord, whom we serve faithfully. And who we look to redeem us at the end of time. And all other things have melted with fervent heat. The earth also and the works are therein are burned up. There will shine the glorious kingdom of the Lord and the faithful citizens thereof. Raised in glory to walk the streets and hallowed halls of the Almighty in perfect perfectness. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to obey the gospel, the one gospel. Or if you're a child of God and you've sinned, we urge you to repent and come back to the Lord in confession of sins and praying for forgiveness. And do so now while we stand and sing.